Hi, I'm Sal Davison. Um, I'm the lead writer on No Longer Home, which is um, the, the game we just released. Um, uh, oh, sorry. I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm Hannah Lee. I'm lead artist on No Longer Home. And Tumble Grove is like the, the collective name for the two of us when we do stuff together, whether it be games or illustration. Awesome, okay. So how did how did Humble Grove first come about as you know you say it's a collective term for, for you both, but like how did how did that happen? It happened uh, it was either right before or after graduating university, wasn't it? I can't remember what what was it after? It, it was it was right after, wasn't it? Yeah, so we, probably. Yeah. So we um we didn't get chatting properly until like summer second year um we we're very awkward as students um, <laughs> and um and then we moved in together partway through third year um, yes and um and yeah and then then after spending a year together we decided we wanted to make something together it was like no longer home started as like a, a, a project to just keep us in contact. Um, sorry, I'm just tapping my camera because my um, <laughs> phone went on low battery. Oh no, you're fine. Totally fine. Um, <laughs> so, uh, No Longer Home is kind of a second iteration of On Friary Road. Uh, so what prompted the original idea for On Friary Road and how did you expand on that to create No Longer Home? So Friary Road's actually the prequel to No Longer Home and right. No Longer Home actually used to be called 29. Um, that was like the working title. So I think, so Fire Row kind of came between like the genesis of 29 and like No Longer Home is sandwiched between that. Um, but it kind of just started off as like a personal project and we weren't really planning on doing too much with it we just wanted to make a vertical slice but um at some point we just it used to just be the studio that we modeled and we were gonna keep the game very compact and just in that environment but we decided to model the whole flat in the end and we realized that there were like more stories that we could tell about like personal issues or um just kind of like the process of going through university and graduation and how it how sucky it feels after that I suppose yeah and then Ferrari Road was a a prelude that we started about a year into development of No Longer Home yeah it was a game jam game yeah initially okay so yeah, it's for the Fermi Paradox Jam so it was then it kind of alongside No Longer Home yeah, it, it yeah. was kind of, um, I think at first we were just kind of doing like a spin-off, a very, very short spin-off. It was like five minutes first, wasn't it, when we did it for the jam. Um, yeah. But with the Kickstarter happening, we decided to make it into like a full quote-unquote game that's about 10, 15 minutes and make it an official prequel to the game. Yeah, Brad. Uh, so when, so I mean, I mean, every developer has their challenges when they make uh, games, obviously, like everyone has their favorite bugs, everyone has their favorite whatevers, um, like their favorite, I guess you'd call them uh, roadblocks, like they'd have to get around a massive roadblock. Yeah. But uh, so when it comes to No Longer Home, what, what are those things for you? Like, what were your challenges? What were your favorite bits? And maybe your not so favorite bits, that kind of thing. I think the biggest challenge is definitely the physical distance between us, which is about 10,000 kilometers yeah. um, and eight to nine hour time difference. Um, that never gets easy. Um, there's a lot of things that get delayed because of this as well. And yeah, it's, it's just something that we kind of had to force ourselves to deal with, but it's not something that's very yeah easy to deal with. Yeah. yeah, I think that in combination with um, our financial situations varying um, throughout like the whole of development. Um, I mean, like 
when, when once we um had fellow traveler as a publisher things were so much smoother in development because you you know not having to worry about uh the financial side of development was such a huge thing and i guess in terms of favorite stuff i guess it's those moments where you know i would go to the uk or you would come to japan and we can actually like have a sit down and be like yes this is what we're going to focus on today yeah. um and being able to just bounce off each other's ideas immediately was always very rewarding and i wish it was that way all the time but for, unfortunately i still don't have a visa and things that have been a problem in no longer home haven't really been solved just yet even after six years yeah and plus you know pandemic yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um all right so how so Bo and ao am i saying that right ao it's supposed to be Ao, but Ao people pronounce it whatever they want so i don't, I don't really mind <laughs> okay so Bo and Ao, um they feel very i mean obviously very personable because a lot of thought and personality has been put into them but how did you how did you bring them to life and make them so personable well, they're just us so you suppose we're just kind of like okay how would he write us but yeah. as characters was that difficult um, for you it was definitely difficult at first because we weren't really sure what to talk about and what not to talk about or like what parts of our personality that we can actually show like whether you know just striking the balance between whether this character is too like negative or something or we're kind of like painting ourselves in a bad light or something but I think we kind of decide to not care in the end. Yeah, I think I think you have to be honest when making that kind of work. And like, um, we, we had like quite a large rewrite um, close to the beginning of this year, um, which was about assessing um, just how impactful the writing was. And, um, and part of that, was figuring out how honest we were being. Um, I feel like there were a lot of moments in the dialogue where we, we could have delved deeper. And so that's that's kind of what we did with the rewrite. Oh, fair. So I'm going to move on to the art style, which is absolutely beautiful. And also like the way that the dioramas, you could kind of move around the rooms and things separate and move, like the transitions are gorgeous. How, how do you settle on that type of art style? And how did you come to think about like the transitions between places? Cause some of the, like, they're actually incredible. Like the, I'll stop fanning, but like, they're good. <laughs> Well, I think the art style was, it came from technical, not technical, um, uh, technical limitations at first, just because like neither of us were like 3D modelers or like, you know, professional 3D modelers anyway. So we decided to keep things low poly. And around that time we were playing a lot of games that were very like simple in its art style like Kinsky Road Zero or Sword and Sorcery and stuff so we took a lot of inspiration from there and like I think the low poly stuff works with the whole kind of like in real life setting just because um, like we don't want things to get too detailed and cluttered so that you don't really know what you're looking at so how, keeping things low poly was very like you take a glance and you immediately know what things are sort of thing. Yeah, it was definitely about communicating the environments very quickly and kind of leaving us space for people to put their own impressions on it. Um, in terms of the transitions, um, th those are those are some things that I've, I guess, I guess those are like directed by me and um, those have evolved a lot over time, but the, the, the sort of thinking was um, trying to treat the environments like theater sets um and so theater often does these things that um put the emotion uh of the emotions of the characters in into like the the movement of the set or like the you know you, you'll, you'll have things um pull away to reveal something behind them um 
things that you know like you get like a, a window or wall that will pull up um and so we really just wanted to be able to imbue the emotional aspects on the game um which i think um we backed up with like the magical realism that's a, actually a great segue into my next question um great so uh oh i've lost my spot Nope, there it is. Uh, so when it comes to magical realism, um, that is, I mean, a lot of people don't think about like the magic next to the mundane or like how the mundane can actually be quite magical in day-to-day -day situations. How did you settle on magical realism as something that you wanted to portray in No Longer Home? I think it was for us a pretty good tool to delve into like the psyche of characters or um to show how they're feeling and stuff so like you get um like i said earlier like walls pulling apart and like the tv shows weird skeleton kind of like just you know weird things like that and i think you know if we actually wrote dissociative states for example into the writing i don't think it would have been um, that interesting, I suppose, or I don't think they wouldn't uh, have been as effective. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, so magical realism was yeah again like a tool for us to sort of explore these emotions and try to decide how to show things in a very um, open ended, but at the same time very like specific manner. Yeah, I think I think magical realism is great at like drawing out the beauty in the mundane um, and having set our game entirely in one flat um, and, and just about the personal relationship of these two characters it, it kind of made sense as a perfect fit yeah no fair um so i think one of you noted or maybe it was both of you so I've been reading some of the interviews and stuff, and obviously uh, I've played No Longer Home. I have yet to play in Fiery of Rogue, please don't judge me. Um, so the uh, you've noted in the past that your passion for environmental storytelling is a big, like you, you know, we just discussed magical realism and like the, the changes between, the transitions between scenes. Um, so constructing these virtual spaces in No Longer Home, telling Bo and Ao's story, uh, and not to be too spoily, but Lou and G, so how do, just trying to make sure that we're not like going into spoiler territory for everybody else, but how do Lou and G, how are they important and how do they interact with Bo now? So they're kind of like, I, I don't like using the term inner demon because I feel like that's a bit too easy, <laughs> but they, they really are kind of like the inner demons of um, Bo and Dao. And I think um, Guy's, very obviously like Bao's inner demon and, and Lou is Bo's but I think um, while Guy's is a lot more negative I think Bo's has a lot more sort of hope I suppose and, and a lot of like I think there's there's also some some guilt there yeah like guilt and regrets but kind of shining them in a ver in a more friendly manner I suppose mm -hmm. um, so yeah they're kind of um, emblematic of how they're feeling deep down or how Bo and Dao are feeling deep down and um, in terms of Guy, he was kind of designed specifically to be like, again, this is not something like <laughs> it, it sounds bad in words, but it's like um, supposed to be more emblematic of Al's undiagnosed bipolar disorder. Like, yep. again, this is, again, very open ended. It's allowed to be interpreted in any shape or form, but that was sort of our initial idea. Yeah, awesome. Uh, it's really hard to, I don't even talk about that kind of stuff, even person to person. So in putting it to a video game makes it extremely, I, I don't know, like real, I guess, because video games are far more interactive than any other type of media. And that's not a question, that's just me talking for no reason. Um, okay, so uh, the idea of point and click narrative, a bit like the, the question around art and how you chose the art style. Um, same thing for point, now I'm a big point and click fan, so I get it, but also 
why point and click for this type of game? I think we just kind of wanted like a sort of gamey aspect to it in a way. <laughs> and we wanted to, the, I think the room rotation mechanic was the first thing that we thought of and point mm. and click just worked best with that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it like, the initial idea was quite different from what we ended up with because we were kind of going to have like a few puzzles based around the rotation mechanic, which I think probably wouldn't have worked very well with the game. So I'm glad we didn't end up doing that. Yeah, I think we wanted um, to do something close to Fez, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't think it would have worked very well. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think like with point and click, I, I think it it's reflective of the design as, as a whole, where like we kind of wanted the game to feel like you were playing multiple actors uh, or, or directing a play. Um and have it having that distance so you've got like the third person camera and um, you can see everything at once um that was also sort of trying to be reflective of of a, of a stage play and even like the rotation mechanic the idea came from um having visited a theater um set production uh studio um, where they were making this huge rotating set, like uh, two stories, I think, um, and you'd you'd like it would rotate, and you could see different rooms and different characters, um, and so that that was a huge influence behind that mechanic as well. That's awesome. They in Sydney, they occasionally have like a floating sets in the uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge area next to the mm. Opera House. And they do something similar where they, they rotate the whole set and like, it's really cool. Anyway, um, I am just putting way too much of my own talking <laughs> in this interview. It's totally fine. No, that's cool. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, No Longer Home soundtrack, obviously pretty stellar. Uh, so who, who worked on the soundtrack? What was that like? And if it was somebody else between the two of you or somebody else, um, how did you go about trying to find the style of music and getting music that fit no longer home? Um, uh, oh, sorry, you go ahead. Okay, uh, the music was done by Ellie Rainsbury, um, but also we had uh, a couple of other collaborators working with them. Um, so it's kind of like a, a team effort, three people. Yeah. Um, um, Ellie, we met at Feral Vector in 2016, 16, was it? I think yeah. so. Um, uh, Feral Vector was like the, the first games show that we showed No Longer Home at at all. Um, and so that, that was a huge part of um, just the, the sort of validating what we were what we were doing um and we we definitely have felt like a huge part of the community there and um yeah going there meant that we met ellie and um discovered their music and decided it was a perfect fit um one, one of the other collaborators derek daly is a um personal friend of mine and um uh I've, I've known him since secondary school age. So um, we've worked on a, quite a lot of projects together. And the last collaborator, uh, Paul's Menu, aka Michael Berto, uh, very kindly provided us the soundtrack to Fry Road because he was just like, oh yeah, I just made this, enjoy. Oh. And <laughs> yeah. because initially um, the game didn't have any audio or music yeah, whatsoever. Absolutely. So we decided to um, put that into the game and you can hear a lot of it actually in No Longer Home, just kind of like remixed or kind of like blending in with environments sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's Ellie is lead composer and you get 
uh, Derek and Paul's menu contributing and yeah it made something really nice that we won't be able to make and it was just you know very nice to listen to yeah, yeah. it's absolutely I, I, gorgeous I think it's quite strange ha- sort of having the soundtrack to a, a very specific era in our lives yeah um, it does it does make me quite emotional listening to it that's so sweet <laughs> um Okay, uh, how do you want uh, No Longer Home to connect with players who have might gone through similar experiences and what do you hope they'll take away from playing the game? I mean, I've already seen a couple of people have like an existential crisis. Oh, no. I, I feel bad, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, it resonated, resonated with them enough that they're feeling this way, we must have done something right. So there's that sort of I don't know, as horrible as it sounds, it is instant gratification. <laughs> um, it's like, okay, sorry for putting you through this, but at the same time, we're very glad that you're not alone, we're not alone, and as much as this, you know, whole situation about visas or graduating sucks, and it's something that's really difficult to recover from, and wish it wasn't there in the first place, it's very nice that um, we can sort of get this instant solidarity with our players. Yeah, I, I think anyone who's who's graduated recently or has gone through education at all it is probably going to hit home with um, definitely definitely a little bit more so with art students because because Bo and Al were on an art course and uh, and we were and. Um, like some of the people, quite a few of the people actually that have um, interviewed us about the game so far that are people who have done arts courses that have been very excited to talk to us because of that. And a couple of people have said the the experience is a bit too specific that those bits they can't really relate to. Yeah. But I think that's a good thing just because like if the whole thing was just hashtag relatable, then I feel like anyone could do that um but we it was important for us to add our own very specific experiences in it um just to see how like intersectional these issues are and how you know education for example um affects our sort of um identity with nationality and stuff um yeah these like i don't think any of these problems are standalone they all kind of like merge with each other here and there um yeah. so it's good that we were able to sort of show those sides of like this whole thing as well yeah for me it was very important to show how um education fails the working class and um the sort of talk about like the gentrification of london um and how hostile london has become to the poor yeah as someone who's from uh, the South in the United States originally, I get it. Um, okay, uh, last two questions. We've actually gone through this super quick. So uh, at the end, I might ask if there's anything extra you want to add. But first, how does saying goodbye factor into the design of No Longer Home? And was it difficult to work with that concept while making the game and having to say goodbye yourselves? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> short answer yeah. <laughs> um yeah like you know first year two of development was very very hard because um it there was just so many things that we had to adjust to which was you know making a game that i've at least never done that before cells done that um for their final year project but we've not really done anything like commercial or we've not really worked mm-hmm. on any big projects together again there's the um there's a huge distance between us like time wise and distance wise like physical distance um and there's still that shock of graduating university and not really knowing what to do so i think yeah a lot of our um the time that was spent for development um i think at least half of it was kind of in the mental state of where Bo and Dal were and no longer home, just like feeling very lost and not really knowing whether we're doing the right thing and stuff like that. So 
it, it was definitely very hard and like the whole saying goodbye to each other aspect was hard as well like we would see each other every so often but there was always a goodbye that followed in the end um and yeah again doesn't get any easier yeah yeah like Hannah said like the issues brought up in the longer home still haven't been resolved and um you know if Hannah was able to well I, I don't want to speak for you but I I I, I get the impression you very much still like to leave, live in the UK if you're able to. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, you know, it's still always a process of saying goodbye. Hopefully in the next, in the near future, that will be solved or in, in some shape or form, you know. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. I promise this one's much lighter. Uh, are there any plans for future games from Humble Grove. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, extremely different from No Longer Home um, theme wise, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And, and still in very early ages, like stages of uh, pre production. And it, it might turn into something completely different by the time it gets to production. But um, we, we kind of want to do something. Um, horror influenced um uh we're probably it'll probably be very narrative led and uh probably sort of point and click thing very dialogue focused um but very very different characters yes <laughs> very different settings um also fictional <laughs> yes yeah 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 that's the other huge thing yeah you know? It might be um, semi-autobiographical. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm like very excited to work on this just because I want to see how people react to it. Because you know, no longer home is like a very. I wouldn't say it's a comfy game, but it's very like homely sort of game, and it's very slow paced, and um, you know, nothing huge happens. But yeah, this yeah. new one, things will happen. <laughs> yeah, there, there might there might be some violence in the in the next game. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, that's all of well, that's all the questions that we've put together. Um, you know, y'all were great. Is there anything that y'all want to talk about that you think people might want to know about No Longer Home, about Humble Grove, about yourselves, um, to kind of round out the panel? Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, if if you're going to art school, <laughs> um, my 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 heart is with you. <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> Uh, it, it kind of feels you like you get a struggle for work afterwards. Yeah, you know, it kind of feels like like you're you're a mum with like a white handkerchief and just kind of like <laughs> waving it to your son that's going to war or something. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, especially now with the pandemic as well, like it's uh, like art school has to be a very like physical thing. And you have to be like interacting with people. Um, face to face and doing a lot of physical things so like having to do that remote i can't really imagine what it's like yeah yeah i i'm so glad that i i wasn't doing my course during the pandemic it's it's got to be really rough yeah but if yeah i mean you know if you're passionate about it good luck maybe yeah. you might make a game as well it's, yeah it's, yeah why, it's fun. why not it's fun yeah <laughs> yeah it's you know it it's time consuming and it's a lot harder than you think but it's fun and i think it, it when, whatever you make it does feel worth it in the end i think that's the most important thing and a great way to i think end up the panel so thank you uh both for uh entertaining me first up because I'm very selfish and also uh, doing this panel for PAX Together. 